In the last lecture, we went over matter and energy, endothermic reactions, exothermic reactions, physical change versus chemical change, how to read significant, how many uh, significant numbers. Okay, now today I would like to do uh, the phase changes, right? I'd like to look at the different phases of matter because they're very different, right? So really in terms of how the molecules are spread apart and whether or not they take the shape of their container. Okay, so we have solids, liquids, and gases. And the way I always remembered it was for a solid, okay, very tight. Okay, for a liquid, moves around a little bit, all right? And then for a gas, it moves all over the place, okay? These guys are, need as much space as they can get. Liquid is fine being at the bottom, and so is solid, okay? And so this one, uh, very important. Now, the only thing about it is, is gas is most complex because they can be compressed, and therefore you can start applying pressure to these things. So we're going to talk about pressure, temperature, volume, the different gas laws that are out there. Okay, so next. Uh, phases of matter. First is about a gas. Let's talk about what we know about kinetic molecular theory and this behavior of gases. And so first thing is gases don't have a definite volume nor a definite shape. They can be compressed and they want to be as far apart from each other as possible. And this comes into the idea of diffusion, right? Remember diffusion? Diffusion is when the molecules want to spread apart, okay, especially in, um, in a gas uh, phase. Right? They want to be as far apart as possible. They want to exert as little pressure as possible. Now, to take this a step further, you need to know kinetic molecular theory, or KMT. Basically, this is talking about how gas molecules travel, right? First, they travel in a straight line. Secondly, sometimes, like you saw in the previous slide, they'll collide into one another. And when they do, they transfer the energy from the first one to the second one, or they might equally get it, right? But energy is transferred, and also bonds might be formed. Whenever bonds are formed, energy is absorbed. When bonds are broken, energy is released. So all this is happening, right? And they take the volume of their container, and also one very important one is there are no forces of attraction. So this is like not magnetic. They're nonpolar for the most part, a lot of the gases, and so they're gonna bounce all over the place. Okay, great. Let's see what else we have. Okay, now, pressure. So I was talking about pressure before. Pressure is very simple. It is the amount of force that is exerted on a given space. Okay, so uh, for example, right, we have um, uh, this barometer here. Well, this is a particular type of barometer. It, it measures uh, pressure, but it uses mercury. Okay, and mercury, we remember, is the symbol Hg. And right, we're going to measure this as millimeters of mercury, right, just as I wrote over here. Standard pressure. Okay, so this is just basically what we see standard. One atmosphere, standard. Okay, 760 torr, 760 millimeters of mercury, or even 101.3 kilopascals. The one that you're going to have to know really is this one. That's the one that always shows up. And in all the formulas, we expect you to apply atmospheres and not use torr or these other numbers. Okay, so one atmosphere, very simple. This is what it would be at sea level. Okay, this is at zero elevation, right? Right there on the Earth's crust. Okay, beautiful. Okay, measuring pressure. So if you're gonna measure pressure, you need either a barometer. Barometer is great for measuring atmospheric pressure. And yes, they do use the units millibars, but you could convert it into atmospheres. Okay, and the other one is something called a manometer. Okay, a manometer basically releases the gas, okay? Basically on the, uh, the air pressure, right? It's able to push the gas forward and we're able to read how much gas uh, or pressure is being exerted on this. Okay, next, a gas law. Okay, so we have Boyle's law. First, we're gonna, these laws were made about 200 years ago, okay? There was Boyle and there was Charles. First is Boyle's law. What Boyle did was he had a gas in a container and he compressed it, okay? That's a piston. And the piston pushes down on the gas molecules and then he saw something happening, right? He noticed that as he uh, increased the pressure, the volume decreased, okay? So they were inversely proportionate or it was an indirect relationship, all right? Can you see that? The amount of space in here is the volume, and the pressure is very low at this point. Push it down, and now we have more pressure. Pressure increases, and the volume decreases, okay? Very simple law, but yet very important. And so here's the formula, P1 times V1 is equal to P2 times V2. Now, also, they might show you the graph for what Boyle's Law looks like. It is not, now, very important. Sometimes they'll show you this. 
Okay, I saw in one test they put this choice on there. And a lot of kids were like, oh, that's perfect because as right as, as a pressure, so we could think of pressure being down here, pressure's over here, and volume's over here. Right? And as pressure increases, volume decreases, you think the graph looks like that. Common mistake. Watch out for that trap. It's actually more of a curve. Okay, and it, and it never reaches. See, by being like this, you're indicating that numbers will eventually go negative, and that doesn't happen. Okay, it just slowly, slowly approaches. It's not like temperature. Okay, we don't really measure pressure with negative units. And so it approaches zero, but never actually makes it there. It's more of like of a limit. Like a limit you've seen in calculus. Okay. Okay, now here's another thing about the uh, gas laws. We have Charles's law. Charles's law is the second gas law. Again, 200 years ago, very old. All right? But what happened here was, okay, he's got his weight or piston over here, and here's his gas molecules at a really low temperature of negative 65 degrees Celsius. Okay, and then these gas molecules, he increases the temperature, and it's 250 degrees Celsius. This is really, really hot. Boom. Okay, this weight goes up, and all of a sudden, they want to occupy more volume. Okay, you make it warmer, the gas molecules are going to move around faster, faster. More collisions, more collisions. They're going to want to spread farther and farther apart. They're moving so, so fast. Here, they're moving a lot slower, especially at negative 65 degrees Celsius. So this is what he did. Okay, and so uh, he graphed the, the data. And as you can see, it's a straight line going up. Whenever we see it going up in this direction, this is a direct relationship. One goes up. The other goes up. So every time the uh, temperature went up, because that was what he was able to control, that was the independent variable, the dependent variable also went up, okay? And so a direct relationship. All right, very nice. So no Charles's law. Charles's law is V1, okay, divided by T1 is equal to V2 over T2. Very nice. And this is basic stuff. Okay, temperature now. So temperature uh, is, is going to come up over and over again. One of the most important temperatures that we're going to use is Kelvin. Okay, so this K stands for Kelvin. Okay, Kelvin is no negative units. It goes from zero to whatever temperature you can get it to. I've seen in some books 1,000 Kelvin, 1,500 Kelvin, talking about like the, the Earth's core, right? What's, what, how hot it is in the center of the Earth. So if you ever want to uh, figure out Kelvin, okay, it's just that zero degrees is equal to 273 Kelvin. So anytime I have the Celsius temperature, I just add 273 and then I can get the Kelvin temperature. So if I had 100 degrees Celsius, that would be equal to 373 Kelvin. All right, all I did was take 100 plus 273 and I got 373. Nice and simple here. This is just a thermometer that has broken, and some thermometers actually have mercury in it as well. Mercury can be used to measure both temperature and pressure. And so this is one of those hazards in the lab, okay, that if they ever, you ever break a thermometer, don't try to clean this up. If you touch that mercury with your finger, it's gonna absorb into your skin, okay, get past the epithelial cells into your bloodstream, and that can actually reach the brain and cause some real bad brain damage. Mercury is not good. It's known to make people crazy. I remember there were stories about the Mad Hatter. They used to put mercury in the hats, all right? And uh, in Alice in Wonderland, I think he actually dipped it into the mercury and put it on his head. That's what made him so mad. But people who made the hats, okay, the hat companies, they used to line it with mercury, and the mercury used to, eventually, if you sweat and you wear it for a long time, it seeps into your head. Okay, let's combine Charles and Boyle's law, and what do you get? Okay, you get just a mixture, right? P1, V1 over T1 is equal to P2, V2 over T2. All right, these formulas are very simple. Just keep in mind that pressure is always measured in atmospheres, volume is measured in liters, and temperature is measured in Kelvin. If you keep those units like that, you'll be fine, okay? And just make sure, they'll try to trick you. Sometimes they'll give you milliliters, convert it. Okay, uh, if they give you uh, atmospheres, then you're fine. Or if they give you some other pressure, make sure you convert it. If they give you Celsius, that's another thing like that they like to do. Make sure you convert it into Kelvins. Okay, great. Let's move on. Okay, so now Dalton's law of partial pressure. So basically, let's say I wanted to find what is the total pressure of air. Air has consisted of a lot of things. So Dalton's law looked like this. It was P total is equal to P1 plus P2 plus P3, P3 plus P4, da, 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 da. As many 
partial pressures, okay? These little guys over here, that stands for partial pressure. So the partial pressure of air. All right, so let's see. So we got, there is the total. So what does air consist of? Oh, some carbon dioxide. Here's the pressure of carbon dioxide, a very low 0.05. Partial pressure of water vapor is 1.28. Argon, 0.97. Nitrogen, 78. About 78% 78 of the air is nitrogen. About 21% is oxygen. And so these are the partial pressures. And what you simply do is add all these pressures, and then you get the total over there. It seems like common sense, but you can measure partial pressure, and that was what Dalton had, had accomplished. Very nice. Okay, Graham's law of effusion. Okay, this is really cool. So it sounds like, effusion sounds like the word diffusion. And you remember diffusion was the spreading of molecules. Well, effusion is basically a gas traveling through a really, really tiny hole. And so that's what I'm trying to show you over here. There's a little pinhole. Pinhole meaning we took a pin, bink, and we, 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 we poked a, like a lining of a membrane or paper, okay, and then uh, the gas has to pass through that tiny, tiny little hole. It really is how fast can it pass through this tiny hole? Right, and if you wanted to figure that out, the rate, okay, it would be rate one over rate two is equal to the molar mass of the second one by the molar mass of the first one, or the molecular weight, if you want to think, or the molecular mass. Molar mass is what that stands for. So let's say, for instance, I wanted to find out what was the rate of hydrogen to oxygen. So I'm just going to write it like this, H2 to O2. Okay, what, what, is, what is the rate of this uh, ratio? Okay, so just like any ratio, you're going to put hydrogen first, because it appears first, and then I'm going to put oxygen next. Okay, and then what I have to do here is I just have to uh, square root, right, there, their molecular masses. Now just keep in mind that hydrogen is the first gas, so then its molecular weight should be down here. So hydrogen's molecular weight is just going to be 2. Right, because one hydrogen would be one and two would be two. Okay, so then I have oxygen over here. Oxygen gas would be 16 plus 16, that would be 32. Okay, equals, this would be the square root of 16 equals four. So in other words, hydrogen travels four times faster through that tiny little hole than does oxygen. Okay, and you can do this with any gas that you need to. He, he was able to really compare a lot of different rates just by using the molar mass, this was a huge, huge accomplishment, okay? Because we actually don't have to have the gases available to really find out what's the difference in rates. Okay, the ideal gas law. So I remember being in college, this became very important. We didn't do the mole yet, but uh, when we do, we'll learn. Okay, so nice and labeled for you here. P equals pressure, that's in atmospheres. Volume is, in, uh, is V, that's gonna be in liters. Okay, number of moles, we're just gonna put a number there, whatever the number of moles is. Now when we get to the mole, this will become more efficient, okay? R is the gas constant. The gas constant is equal to zero, okay, point zero. Three. All right, all you have to do is just remember that number and you'll be fine. The temperature is measured in Kelvin. Okay, and so um, very important about what is an ideal gas. Mostly the noble gases are closer to ideal. So on the right side of the periodic table. Okay, they should be as far apart as possible, like helium would be great for this. Uh, should have a little, as little mass as possible as well. Okay, and should have no attraction for each other. Hydrogen gas would be a great ideal gas as well. Okay, so when you have an ideal gas, and the question will indicate that it is an ideal gas, whip out this formula, PV is equal to NRT. Okay, now we're up to the second phase of matter, liquids. Now we said liquids have what? They, have, they take the shape of their containers so that you can actually measure their volume. Gases we couldn't because you can compress them and the volume can change. But the volume for liquid stays true. However, it doesn't have a shape. Okay, and so this is pretty much what we see with liquids. Moving on, okay, liquids have a boiling point that we have to keep in mind, and so the boiling point is when the vapor pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure. All right, so when those two values are equal to each other, the solution or the liquid should boil. All right, so for example, I put boiling water here, and I wanted to bring up the top. This is Mount Everest, by the way. This is the tallest mountain uh, that we have in the world. And so say, for instance, you weren't at the top, but you were near the top, and you tried to boil water. Okay, what, what would be the boiling point of water? Would water's boiling point be the same? And the answer is no, because the atmospheric pressure is different. 
So up here on the mountaintop, you have low pressure up here. Very low pressure. The pressure is hard to breathe up there. Well, down on the bottom, you have high pressure. Okay, so down here would be pretty, pretty high. All right, so considering this low pressure, I've seen it where 80, 85 degrees Celsius is uh, the new boiling point. See down here, water's boiling point is 100 degrees Celsius. Until it reaches 100 degrees Celsius, you won't see a little bubble start to form. But up here, 85, 88 degrees Celsius, all of a sudden water is boiling. So the boiling point of water has changed as you went up. So keep that in mind. Boiling point can change depending on the pressure, especially when it comes to elevation. Okay, but keep in mind that different pressures will do different things. Like I'll give you an example. The other night I was um, I was baking cake. All right, I was making cupcakes, and on the box of cake mix it said, a uh, note at higher elevations. Okay, you can lower your oven. Wow, really? Yeah, that makes sense because there's lower pressure at higher elevations. Okay, some of these um uh, skyscrapers have really really high uh you know floors, and the elevation is actually higher, right? So the pressure is lower. Okay, this looks great. Let's erase this. Okay, solids now. Now, solids have a definite shape and volume, okay? Uh, and one important thing to remember is that it has a melting point, okay? Different solids have different melting points, and they also have uh, their freezing point. Now, one thing is that these two values are equal to each other. The freezing point and the melting point should be the same value, okay? And uh, they make a geometric solid, right? They're tight, they're compressed. Yes, the electrons and the atoms are always vibrating and moving, but it is the most still of all three phases, okay? Because it's the most compressed. Right, and it has a definite shape, and it has a definite volume, okay? We can find the volume of a solid using two methods. One, if it's a geometric solid, we can simply measure the length and multiply it by the width and the height. Or if we wanted to find the volume of an irregular solid, like this piece of chalk or this remote, okay, if I wanted to find out the volumes of these, I would get a graduated cylinder, I'd fill it up, and I'd measure what was the exact volume, then I'd drop it in. This is called the water displacement method, right? And then I'd read the new volume. I'd take the final volume and subtract it from the or initial volume, and I'd have the volume of, of this thing, in milliliters, right, or this thing. Okay, great, so phase changes. So you definitely have to know which phases. Okay, so what happens when a solid goes to a liquid? Okay, it's melting, right? A liquid goes to a solid, it's called freezing. Liquid to a gas, evaporation. Okay, now these three students get. Don't mess these three up over here, please, okay? Uh, gas to a liquid, condensation. Remember precipitation back in earth science, okay? This is what happens when the clouds start producing liquid, gas to liquid. Solid to a gas. Now these two are very important. I get students forgetting them over and over. Students that like finish chemistry and, and go on to new sciences in their high schools, they'll forget this. Make sure you don't, okay? So solid to a gas, sublimation, and gas to a solid is deposition. So some examples of these. Um, oh, this is another great way to remember it. Okay, the uh, nice interconversion inter of states. And so just as we mentioned before, you have everything right here for you. Okay, now the next thing, I want to give you some examples of this one. When you go from a solid to a gas. Okay, there's three solids that really go into a gas very well, and they like to ask it a lot on the SAT too. Here they are. Carbon dioxide solid going to a carbon dioxide gas. That's dry ice. And that's this stuff over here. Okay, so for example, the ice cream man uses this. The ice cream trucks, they use dry ice because it doesn't turn into a liquid. At the end of the day, it's not this big messy puddle. Okay, it immediately sublimates into a gas. Okay, cold stuff. Secondly, naphthalene or mothballs. I put a picture up over here for you to see. Mothballs are used to kill moths that eat clothes. And so what you do, if you're going to store some of your clothes in an attic, you could put the mothballs in your pockets, and then that'll pretty much be a good repellent. Because moths eat uh, your clothes, right? They put holes in them. And if I really want to save like a wedding dress or something, I, I would use mothballs hopefully to store it. Um, then again, uh, I don't know much about wedding dresses. Uh, then iodine. Okay, iodine solid turns into this purple gas. It's pretty creepy, okay? But I'm not talking about the iodine in your medicine cabinet. That's an iodine tincture. Okay, this is iodine solid, I2. Okay, solid iodine. And it sublimates very nicely. Okay, so now you're thinking about these gas laws. Try to think about what would happen if I put a balloon in the freezer. Okay, what would happen if I tied a balloon to my belt and I climbed the mountain? Think about Boyle's Law and Charles's Law, very important stuff. 
Heating curve, okay, the next thing. So now, if you wanna go through all three phases, nothing better than a heating curve, and so it looks like this. When you're going from A to B, right, you're just still a solid. So you imagine this was water, right there would be zero degrees Celsius. I'll put zero right there, that's zero degrees Celsius. Over here, you're just a solid, okay? And then when you reach B to C, when during a phase change, temperature does not change. No change in temperature during the phase change. All that's, being ha all that's happening is the energy is being absorbed, the heat is being absorbed, okay? So you're going from solid to liquid here. Then from C to D, now I've seen this all the time on the uh, SAT too, where they'll just label this and then you have to say what's what, right? So this is the liquid. Okay, nice liquid phase. And then from uh, D to E, we're gonna do one more phase change. We're gonna go from liquid to gas. Okay, notice that this is absorbing a lot of uh, what energy, right? But it's not the temperature isn't going up. Just because the temperature isn't going up doesn't mean it's not absorbing energy. It's boiling rapidly. Oh, you'll see the energy. What? Okay, and then finally you hit what? Your gas. Okay, and so be aware of how this looks. Right about here, I'd probably put 100 degrees Celsius, and so we're good. Okay, heating curve of water or any substance that can go through all three phases. Okay, most things can go through all three phases. It's just if you have the right pressure and the right temperature, you can do that. And so speaking of which, uh, we have the triple point. And so basically this is where solid, this right here would be the triple point, that little dot, okay? This is where solid, liquid, and gas all exist at the same time. And so for example, if this was water, water could exist as a, a solid, liquid, and gas all at the same time. If the pressure is equal to 4.57 atmospheres. So you need a lot of pressure, it looks like. Second, so maybe in a submarine, you could probably get that if you go under the, the water, right? And then uh, another thing is uh, the, the temperature. Okay, so that's what we have here. Temperature over here and uh, pressure is on the y-axis. And so the temperature for this has to be zero, zero, one degrees Celsius, okay? That's about freezing, but it's not quite freezing. And that's why you get all three phases existing at the same time. But the pressure is really what's giving it to you. Okay, guys, so this ends lecture two. Okay, on our gas laws and our phases of matter. I hope that you guys are taking the practice test seriously and are reserving about an hour a day for SAT2 chemistry study. All right, guys, until next time, I'll see you. Be safe.